Japanese government officials have approved the first energy strategy since the Fukushima Daiichi accident three years ago. The new basic energy plan designates nuclear power generation as an important baseload energy source. As we face the reality that the degree of our dependence on imported fossil fuels is greater than during the first oil crisis in the 1970s, I cannot easily say we can halt nuclear power generation. The newly approved plan defines nuclear energy as a vital source for providing power around the clock. It calls for the reopening of nuclear power plants if the government gets the thumbs up from regulators. But the plan also notes that the country should reduce its reliance on nuclear power through energy saving as well as the use of renewable energy and thermal power generation. It says the nation will aim to produce more renewable energy than it previously targeted. Government officials had pledged that they would make renewable sources account for 20 percent of the country's total power supply by 2030. The energy strategy also supports the recycling of spent nuclear fuel. The Abe administration's junior coalition partner has been urging the dismantling of a fast breeder reactor called Monju, but the plan maintains that it's aimed at obtaining research results. It adds that the re reactor serves as an international research base for reducing the volume and the toxicity of nuclear waste. Nuclear regulators are investigating newly uncovered cases of missed inspections at the Monju reactor. The plant's operation has repeatedly been suspended because of a sodium coolant leak and other problems. The Nuclear Regulation Authority prohibited the restart of the reactor last May after discovering that workers failed to conduct 14,000 safety checks. The Japan Atomic Energy Agency operates the plant. Last September, it announced that it had completed all inspections, but the regulators say they found other problems. They say workers overlooked at least nine items on a safety checklist, including a temperature gauge and a switch for a backup cooling pump. The Monja reactor first reached criticality in 1994, but its operation was suspended the following year. It's remained offline for more than 14 and years. And a massive research project involving floating wind farms designed to save space and maximize power generation. Specifically, the project aims to prove the feasibility of wind turbines installed on floating platforms in deep ocean areas surrounding Japan. The research covers everything from designing floats suited to the local weather and environmental conditions to things like designing power transmission systems. In November of 2013, they installed a test platform with blades that were about 40 meters long and a 2 megawatt power generation capacity. And work is now underway to complete two much larger 7 megawatt capacity systems with 80 meter blades by 2015. Well, installing large-scale wind farms in the ocean is just about the only option here in Japan because of the limited space. And these should be a great way to help Fukushima continue to rebuild. This booth features a number of projects involving both businesses and government from Shizuoka Prefecture. This setup, equipped with a rather unusual looking propeller, is actually a hydroelectric generator intended for small-scale power generation, which was developed by a group of local companies involved in the metal production industry. Here we see the system undergoing testing back in Shizuoka. The results of this initial effort were used to further refine the system, including the development of a special structure designed to increase flow rate and pressure around the propeller. Initially backed by the local government, the project is now also being funded by local banks. Well, leave it to the people of Japan to be so practical. This is a great repurposing of old technology that taps a power source that's been unused until now. It's revolutionary, isn't it? People from a town evacuated after the Fukushima nuclear accident are back to enjoy a seasonal spectacle. About 500 cherry trees line a main street in Tomioka. 
The blossoms used to attract many visitors before residents were ordered to evacuate. The town is still designated as a no-entry zone. People are allowed to enter part of the town during the day, but they aren't able to view cherry blossoms where radioactivity is still high. My house is still damaged, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to live here again. But it's my hometown, and I really love it. If the disaster hadn't happened, everyone in this town would be enjoying the cherry blossoms. Whether or not people will ever return, the flowers will keep on blooming. People in Hiroshima and around the world will mark the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombing that destroyed the city. An international group of government officials and ordinary citizens is meeting there this week to discuss ways to rid the world of nuclear arms. But their opinions on how to accomplish this task remain far apart. NHK World's Chie Yamagishi reports. The mission of the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Initiative, or NPDI, is to reduce or eliminate nuclear weapons. The group consists of 12 member nations, none of which has nuclear weapons of its own. Japan and Australia took the lead to form the group in 2010. The United States and Russia agreed to drastically reduce the number of nuclear warheads they had deployed. But an estimated 17,000 nuclear arms remain around the world. North Korea has been conducting nuclear tests, raising concerns that possession of such weapons may become even more widespread. In February, representatives from 146 states met in Mexico to discuss the long-term impacts of nuclear weapons. Some called for a complete ban on nuclear arms. They said their very existence is contrary to human dignity. NPDI members' meeting in Hiroshima will also discuss the catastrophic humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. Some ministers and citizens, including an atomic bomb survivor, met on Friday. Uh, Akira Kawasaki was there on behalf of an international coalition of non-governmental organizations. Kawasaki said opinions differ among NPDI member countries. Some, including Mexico, want to ban all nuclear weapons, but others that fall under the so-called U.S. nuclear umbrella are aiming for a gradual reduction. Japan and Australia are among those countries. I think having this nuclear weapons conference in the city of Hiroshima is a very right moment for those countries to rethink uh, their concept of security or their concept of the reliance on, nu on nuclear deterrence. For the first time, a country that possesses nuclear weapons will take part. A representative of the U.S. will attend the meeting as an observer. It was a great opportunity for me to be able to talk to the NPDI ministers, hear what their goals and priorities are for the non-proliferation treaty, and for me to be able to express uh, the U.S. views on this matter. Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida will chair a ministerial meeting on Saturday. This is NPDI's first meeting in Japan, a country which has experienced atomic warfare. I'd like to use this opportunity to send a strong political message. It remains to be seen whether a meeting in a city with such a tragic history will help participants to reach their goal of a nuclear-free world. Cinemagoers in Japan will soon encounter a true story of reconciliation between once bitter enemies during World War II. The Thailand-Burma Railway was constructed by the Imperial Japanese Army using forced labor, including many prisoners of war. So many people died that some call it the Death Railway. One of those who survived is the subject of the film opening this month in Tokyo. NHK World's Miyuki Tokoi reports.
It's the beginning of World War II. Eric, a British officer, is taken prisoner by the Japanese army and forced to work on building the Thailand Burma Railway. You built this transmitter to tell the Chinese about our railway. He is tortured by Japanese soldiers on suspicion of being a spy. Among them is Takashi, an interpreter who cross-examines him relentlessly. After the war and back in England, Eric finds that his experience as a POW has left deep mental scars. His post-traumatic stress disorder leaves him plagued by visions of the interpreter who tormented him. With his wife Patricia's support, Eric resolved to meet Takashi again after spending fruitless years trying to overcome his dark past. Even though there are some dark things in the film, there are also, the film is ultimately about life. It's about something very positive. It's about people coming together, which is, I think, very important. The movie, The Railway Man, is based on the memoirs of a real British prisoner of war. Eric Lomax was held captive by the Japanese army for three and a half years. He worked on his memoir despite the torment of PTSD and continued difficulty relating to others. Then one day, Lomax happened to spot a photo of the interpreter in a newspaper. He learned from the article that the interpreter was called Takashi Nagase and had visited Thailand more than a hundred times. Nagase wanted to make up for what he had done during the war. After corresponding with each other for a few years, they finally met face to face in Thailand. Despite thoughts of revenge, Lomax gradually warmed to Nagase. The two nurtured a friendship that lasted until Nagase died in 2011. Lomax passed away the following year at the age of 93. Lomax's wife Patricia visited Japan for the opening of the film and to talk about her husband's experience. She felt that he would never heal unless he overcame the hatred that had taken root in his heart. He was much better. It was like a convalescence. Hating has to stop. It only hurts the person who does the hating and not the person that the hate's directed at. 200 people came to listen to Patricia speak. Many said they had never heard of the Thailand-Burma Railway. Everybody suffered in the war. No, there were no winners at all. It is possible to reach out with goodwill on all sides, but you have to know the past first before you know what you're talking about. I learned about the cruelty of the Japanese and the cruelty of war, but I also felt the goodness of people from other countries who found it in themselves to forgive us that no matter how hard life is at any point, it can get better with goodwill. We take our own lives in our own hands. We're responsible for them. And it is possible to move on and live the full life that we should do. Patricia is motivated by the hope that by passing on the story of Nagase and her husband, she can help future generations avoid seeing history repeated. Miyuki Tokoi, NHK World.